Hatun wilka tiayukui runakunap suyakunin. In the language of my ancestors, known as Quechua, which is spoken by the descendants of the Inca people of the Andes, what I just spoke is a greeting that loosely translates as sacred salutations, hope of the people, welcome into my heart. And this being the 40th anniversary of the International Near-Death Studies, or Association of Near-Death Studies, I am deeply honored to be able to complement whatever teachings have already been presented by the wonderful participants in this gathering with a perspective born of the Aboriginal cosmology and the Aboriginal ritual artistry known as Kamaska Curanerismo, which is folk healing that is a combination of uh, Catholic liturgy, believe it or not, and pre-Columbian healing methodologies. Yet that is the foundation of the work that I do as a teacher and as a facilitator of transformation and change in the lives of people. And when I say that everybody participating in this gathering is the hope of the people, I mean it in this manner. Near-death experiences, like many anomalous phenomena that, uh, at, thank God, this day and age is now becoming much more recognized as a viable approach to understanding who we are and what it means to be human, are moving into a field of great service to our planet. And in a sense, it's nothing new for this type of phenomena, especially near-death experiences, are the originating foundation for what shamanic practice is about and, so, and what a shamanic cosmovision or worldview is about. It is at the core and at the foundation of all religious experience, as well as journey work, ability to extend our consciousness beyond the encapsulated physicality in which we are. And everybody that is attracted to this particular type of gathering either has had their own experience of a transcendent encounter with multidimensional realities that are an antidote to the sadly pernicious uh, obscurity and, um, and darkness that materialistic uh, dominant culture currently uh, prevails upon planet. So therefore, out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, transformative practices, as well as encounters with otherworldly denizens from these in-between liminal spaces or demonic realms, which we understand in today's lingo as either unidentified flying objects or ultra-terrestrials, are all denizens. They are all inhabitants of these very subtle realms of consciousness, as well as energetic dimensional levels of experience that have been accessible to human beings since time immemorial. My own experience has been founded upon being a walker between worlds like many of you are. And what do I mean by being walkers between worlds? Well, you've experienced something that is out of the ordinary. And you live in a world that expects you to be ordinary. To bridge those two contrasting or polarity realities, it is not an easy thing. It sometimes leads people to question their own sanity. And in my own experience, having encountered these alternate levels of human experience, it was very destabilizing. 
on a personal level, um, I don't know if I would say that my near-death experiences were precipitants of my shamanic healing vocation, yet they definitely deepened my understanding and appreciation of my own multidimensionality, of my own ability to draw from guidance and to draw inspiration from the dreaming, from this uh, transcendent realm that ultimately resides within, from the impermanence that is life, rather than the attachment to certitude and to the control and the need for approval as an ego. So therefore, it helped me die a noble death on a daily basis. For in shamanism, as in many spiritual, psycho-spiritual traditions, we understand that life is simply a, a preparation for that ultimate transition, for that crossing of the veil, and that in our life, in our waking conscious life, we have the ability, we have tools and skills in which the transparency of that veil can be managed, can be modulated, can be either maintained so that the rich experiences that sometimes can be overwhelming to our human frail minds, don't come flooding in and create a disassociative state, but on the contrary, can be channeled in a manner in which they become meaningful experiences rather than fragmentary downloads of, of visions that really have no coherency. And that's what sometimes results in the various psychopathological uh, nomenclatures that we find in the world defined by word as unhealthy. Yet in the shamanic ways of my people of Peru, we understand that a breakdown is actually a breakthrough, a rite of passage. And that encounter with these non-ordinary states of consciousness, no matter how destabilizing they may be in one's life, have an ability to offer us what is known as hambi or medicine spirit, have an integrative function to them, have a opportunity to bring wholeness to where separation had existed, to allow us to reconnect with the sacred dimensions of life, if properly guided and offered a, a path a path that is life transformative in essence. I had three near-death experiences and a multitude of other, what would be called anomalous encounters with alternate realities uh, growing up in Peru, in my country of origin. And the first one I really do not remember, but it was recalled to me by my father who was a physician and it was the result of becoming electrocuted at age two years old. The subsequent two near-death experiences, one at age 10, that was the result of hypoxia. I suffered from severe asthma as a child living in Lima, which is uh, uh, very conducive because of its cloudiness and contamination at that time to difficulties of a respiratory nature uh, growing up, which resulted in me having to be taken to a 12,000 foot high area to live during my fifth grade of schooling, a place called Chosica, where to survive the asthma because I was basically on IV dexamethasone, which is a cortisone, to be able to allow my alveola to open and breathe. So I was very frail. I could not go outside and play. And I was living in darkness. That was of value because it helped me develop a very rich inner life. At the same time, it limited my social ability to have a development like other children. When I was in the area of Chosica, where it was in a higher altitude, 
I had an encounter with these, what I call shining ones, three luminous beings of light, as I was just slipping away through the veil. That it's a long story, but ultimately resulted in the intervention of these beings of light, extracting the asthmatic condition from my lungs and healing me altogether from that condition. The third near-death experience resulted when I was 33 years old and it was due to an auto accident in Lima also, Lima, the capital of Peru. And that was even a stranger experience. It took me two years to even understand that my daily experience with this very thin veil as a result of that um, wasn't that I was dead or wasn't that I was alive. It meant that I was an in-between soul. And that was not an easy thing because at the time I was still having a psychotherapy practice in, in Peru and working for Peru's National Petroleum Company being flown up to the northern parts of the country to work with uh, uh, substance abuse people then that were in their fields, in the oil fields. I was doing all of that not knowing whether I even was alive. Many of you may have experienced that in-between world when you've recently emerged out of a very deeply transformative experience of encounter with non-ordinary realities, be them uh, a Marian op apparition where you see some saintly figure appear to you, or uh, the angelic visitation of beings beyond this world, or the experience of actual going through the tunnel and encountering that heavenly realm known by many names around the planet, depending on cultural preference, as heaven, Shangri-La, Shambhala, Jagartha, the Paititi, the great crystal city of the ancient ones, or whatever preference you have to describe that realm of heightened seventh dimensional awareness in which the most elevated, most refined vibratory frequencies of human consciousness available exist and can take form as beings that can assist one in integrating that experience of leaving body and inhabiting a new form. Therefore, all these experiences basically point to one simple thing, that yes, we are much more than what our social cultural conditioning has tried to hammer into us. And we are much more than just what our three-dimensional material, five sensorial apperception is capable of perceiving. So therefore, why not become an explorer of these altered, alternate realities rather than a slave of the consensual reality that, uh, unfortunately, the powers that be try to impose on us. Now, curiously enough, as a child, I was also very interested in anything having to do with what is now the field of parapsychology. So as simultaneously, when I was doing my apprenticeship in Kamaska Curanderis, more Peruvian shamanic folk healing, that began at the age of 18 years old in 1969, uh, due to various fortuitous encounters with my mentor, Don Celso Rojas Palomino, who because of, I remembered that experience at age 10 when I passed over and was visited by these three shining ones that I'll get into in a little bit. Uh, the, the, what, what, what happened is that my interest in the study of non-ordinary states of consciousness led me to pursue uh, research in, in psychology and in comparative religion. I did my undergraduate at Duke University for that specific reason in which 
the Institute for the Nature Research of the Nature of Man that was founded by J.B. Rhine, the so-called father of experimental parapsychology, was there. It was that was the headquarters, and that was one of the reasons I chose that university to pursue my undergraduate studies. He had already passed at the time that I began my studies there, but the institute was next door to where I was renting my my uh, my room. So I spent a lot of time there doing all sorts of more academic approaches to the study of anomalous phenomena. Uh, also, during that time, I had the great fortune of meeting uh, William Roll, who was uh, the legendary researcher in uh, recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis that he linked to poltergeist phenomena through the uh, Psychical Research Society that also was in Durham, North Carolina. There are famous studies at that time. Uh, Keith Harari was doing uh, experimental work with Bill Roll for uh, doing out of body travel and being able to document that through means that many of you in the field of research, or in research understand how it was done. I won't go into details. Yet I'm mentioning these things because as a result of my own experience breaking through the veil, I still had to have some sort of grounding in the sciences. So I pursued this academic path as well as my shamanic apprenticeship. So I was living this Aboriginal cosmology that included a fascinating rich world of spirits, of souls, of intelligences, of powers, of virtues, of great uh, information that in my normal waking life didn't have a container for them. So I was seeking desperately to find something that I could justify my existence with that had some academic validation to it. Little did I know that as the saying goes, a donkey with a load of books is still a donkey. So no matter how much I pursued this, and I continued because following that, I took my master's at uh, the famed uh, humanistic psychology department at West Georgia College that was uh, founded by Abraham Maslow that from, came down from Brandeis that died soon after that though, but then Mike Ahrens and James Clee and all these very well-known uh, humanistic and transpersonal psychologists took the reins and turned it into what it is now. It was the first place where one could study um, true, uh, a psychology based on transpersonal reality rather than just uh, clinical applications. And I had the great fortune at that time also, having recently come out of that very challenging moment in my life where I had my near-death experience at age 33 that turned my life upside down and uh, uh, made me question my sanity at, 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 a, at a deep level. I had the great fortune of moving out of that and meeting, guess who? Raymond Moody. Good old Ray and I became very good friends because he was my office mate subsequently because I became an adjunct faculty at the West Georgia uh, College at that time, uh, psychology department, that together with Bill Roll, with Mike Ahrens, with Ray Moody, and also with uh, Bob Mazik, we created the Parapsychological Studies Institute, known as PSI, or Parapsychological Services Institute, known as PSI. Raymond was instrumental in my ability to integrate my experiences of what is lies behind what I call the veil into a life that was meaningful. So I thank him very much. And all of that time, I was still doing my apprenticeship down in Peru with my mentor, Don Celso Rojas Palomino, which involved a very systematic approach to accessing these 
non-ordinary states of consciousness that all of you who have had a near-death experience know that you'll never be the same after encountering such a transcendent mode of knowing oneself as immortal in being beyond form fearlessly free to be all worlds times and places that summon me that is a little affirmation that really embodies and coalesces the understanding that marries the shamanic worldview cosmology with the current approach to near-death studies in my humble opinion recognizing truly that consciousness survives bodily death that consciousness is a priori that there's a primacy in it that it exists before this material universe that consciousness known as nuna or yachai saspa in the language of my peoples is a pure cosmic awareness not bound by space and time and i'm not saying anything new that everybody on in this conference isn't already aware of the trick is how to individualize that experience of unlimited awareness and allow it to be a guiding light a beacon for others in the world an ability to open up a path of initiation a rite of passage not only for oneself as a soul but for the anima mundi the living soul of our earth because the increment and a plethora of near-death experiences being reported both because of the access to information and that you find in the internet but also because people are truly having more of them and that is also related of course to the advances in science that can be in medicine that can keep people alive uh, that otherwise would not have had the chance to come back from the other side yet i feel that there's just like there is an increase in the sightings of uh, ultra terrestrial beings and their anomalous craft and there is an increase also in the uh, systematic approach to using out of body experiences as a means of uh, traveling and of gaining information at a distance in a non local sense of the word all of these things are building up as one big portal one big hyperspace tunnel if you may one passageway one bridge that leads us as a human species to unite in a, a identity and an ethos and a sense of purpose and identity as spirit more than just as matter and as such able to integrate the wisdoms of the ancient ones the hermetic wisdoms the gnostic awarenesses all of the great mystery schools of the ancient world that to this point had been relegated just to the libraries forgotten in time are now experiencing a resurgence are now once again becoming the sources of inspiration and of study for many many people we are experiencing on planet a true passage through space time into a fifth dimensional field of human awareness and presence this is these are my own reflections my own understanding and at the same time i feel that fifth dimensional awareness is as simple as just extending yourself beyond the fourth dimension which is duration of an object moving through 
space, which we call time, the fifth dimension simply is closing your eyes and going within and discovering that inner world. That is the within. And there is much more to be discovered through inner exploration, through the navigation of our intercellular, intergalactic space, then there is propelling ourselves into other planets and moons for attempted terraforming of these other worlds beyond the earth as a desperate means of survival uh, of a few. I have no problem with space exploration. As a matter of fact, I am a great proponent and I support it fully. Yet the purpose of it needs to be reframed once again, in my humble opinion, that to leave this planet, we must first meet our own inner universe, our own inner cosmos, our own true home, which is being a two-legged passerby on this extraordinary planet known as Gaia Pachamama. So let me go ahead. These are a lot of words and these are a lot of concepts and a lot of visions that I'm presenting. Yet I'd like to just quite try to bring it all into a synthesis and remind you of a very simple wisdom adage uh, spoken by Sakyamuni Buddha. And it goes like this, the only things that matter at the end of your life is how much you've loved, how gently you've lived, and how gracefully you let go of things that were not meant for you. Now let's break that one down and see how they relate to out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, contacts with ultra-terrestrial beings, sightings of the Virgin Mary or the Nazarene or Krishna or Buddha, uh, they're all part and parcel of being harbingers, pointers, way showers of a different way for humankind. Yet it all boils down to that universally shared experience of love that is at the foundation of everything in the universe. Now, what do I mean by love? Capital L, of course. Love is a primordial human yearning to care for something as much or more than for one's own self, one's own survival, one's own desperate need to exist as an isolated entity from the whole, where our connection with the sacred dimensions of life based on that separation is tarnished, is frayed, and ultimately is destroyed, which is reflected in the way of our current climatological and environmental crises. It is because of the lack of ability to extend our caring for something larger than ourselves, such as the great sacred web of life itself, that we have lost our way as humankind and are paying the consequences. Now, is there a solution? Well, there's no panacea, but there is something that we can all do, especially those of you that have visited the other side that have been able to return from that visitation and been able to integrate that into your own service path. We can write many books, we can teach many classes, yet the most important medicine at this time, this rite of passage for a planet, is to teach love by the way we live. Teach love by the way we live. Those of you that have fresh in your consciousness, the meeting of departed loved ones when on the other side, 
the transformation that occurred in which you were able to let go of your craving for control and approval, all of that is the death that we need. That is what needs to die for really, as in the Gnostic teachings of the Paleo-Christians, as a matter of fact, the notion of if you die before you die, then when you die, you won't die, is the same teaching that we understand as researchers of near-death experience and other anomalous phenomena to be true for humankind as a whole. So here we are. We are here now, all one light within capital W. In the shamanic traditions, we understand that aside from the natural ability that we have to maintain and sustain a relationship with a fifth dimensional level of awareness daily, because in our dream time at night, we are visiting that fifth dimensional plane of awareness. This is according to the shamanic traditions of my people of Peru. When we know that at that dreaming level, we are able to know that we're dreaming, commonly understood as lucid dreaming, and within that self-reflexive knowing awareness that you are in fact dreaming, able to change and manage the circumstances within the dream, that is sixth dimensional awareness. Seventh dimensional awareness is the ability to bring that skill of managing the dream circumstances into manifestation in the third dimensional plane. In other words, as we understand in shamanism, when your waking dream this middle world experience, your sleeping dream, and your daydream, your imaginative faculties, your ability to capitalize on the power of imagination, all have the same elements within them, you're walking your medicine. And to have that medicine be a salve, a healing salve for the world, it takes offering it with unlimited loving intention. That's where the notion of munai, M-U-N-A-Y comes in, which means unlimited love in Quechua, munai, deep compassionate feeling, true caring for something or someone other than yourself that deserves the same attention, the same recognition, and the same presence that you yourself received when visiting these transcendental states of awareness through your own experiences. Your example, your way of being in the world, is the rite of passage, is the bridge that we are moving toward. No matter how dysfunctional the outside world seems to be at this time, there is a place of wholeness, of completion, of unified presence within every person's soul body, which is the same thing as consciousness that is the sanctuary and refuge from the dissonance that is in the outside world. Therefore, the easiest step to connect is going within through simple meditation, through following our breath. Yet always like in the practice of Buddhist metta, in the path of the bodhisattva, to do it by extending compassion out into the world as you sit in peaceful presence. 
as a child of the universe. These, in a nutshell, are the teachings behind NDEs, OBEs, and UFOs as harbingers of a planetary rite of passage, an evolutionary awakening for humankind. Allow me to now return a bit to the place where it all began, for me at least. That fateful day up in the Andes of Peru, where I was 10 years old and had failed fifth grade because I could not go to classes because of my asthma. My father worked for the Institutes of National Health, a branch of the Ministry of National Health. He ultimately became the equivalent of the Surgeon General of Peru, the Director Gener General of National Public Health. In my early, early life, he was stationed in very remote areas, tribal areas of Peru. So from age one and a half to maybe age four, not maybe, to age four, um, we lived in a place called Pucalpa, which is in the eastern rainforest Amazon basin of Peru in a small tribal community of Shipibo people which is an ethnic group very well known in, the, in, in this day and age for their mastery with the vine of the death known or the vine of the soul known as ayahuasca. Then uh, we, he was stationed in Huaraz, which is in the central highlands of Peru, northern highlands of Peru, where the highest mountain peaks of Peru is, where the Apu Huascarán is, and then on the coast of Chiclayo, which is in the northern coast where it is the cradle of Peruvian folk healing traditions known as curanderismo. So in those early formative years, I was exposed more to the consciousness of our tribal peoples, of our First Nations peoples, if you prefer that word, of the indigenous um, worldview. So when I returned to Lima, I felt like a fish out of water. Curiously enough, that's when the full expression of my asthmatiform condition developed, once returning to Lima. It was almost like I had, was in shock from being in these pristine natural environments in which there was a sense of sacred community, even having my father being of European descent and my mother and myself being of U European descent, coming from a city like Lima, we were welcome because we were, my father was bringing public health uh, services to them. And at that time, I was being raised not only by my mother, but a lot of the women, the elder women of those communities. It was, in the little I can remember from those days, a, an idyllic situation. To me, there was no heaven except where I was living at the time. Fast forward to coming to Lima, boom experiencing severe asthmatic condition, a lot of medicines that ultimately really impacted my kidneys in not too healthy of a way and led to reliance on mostly allopathic pharmaceutical medicines to survive. I'm 10 years old, I'm suffocating in my bed, I'm experiencing myself slipping away from this world and I hear these voices. And in those days, my nickname that my father had given me, believe it or not, was Beaver in English, because he, he, was, he spoke five languages. And my mother was in, uh, born in Naples, Italy, but came at a very, at a, at a year and a half, a, her whole family, 14 of uh, brothers and sisters came with their parents to uh, 
to live in the United States. So she grew up in East Haven, Connecticut. She spoke English only at that time, ended up speaking fluent Spanish, of course, yet mostly English was spoken in my home. That's why I'm so well versed in English, did my superior education in universities in the United States as well. But my first language is, is Spanish. And I also speak of Quechua or Runasimi, the language of the, the indigenous populations of the highlands. So I want to situate this within the, this experience of being up outside of Lima, 10 years old, fading away, blissed out because I could, you know, I didn't feel my body. And then I hear this voice in the back saying, beaver, beaver, beaver. And all of a sudden, I managed to kind of come back into body and gently open my eyes. And I see these three shimmering beings, one at the head of my bed and two flanking my bed at the side. And these three beings, the one in front of me, started to communicate, but not in word, in images, uh, which is common in, in most advanced telepathic communication, means of communication, and conveyed, and this is in retrospect, because I was, I became totally forgetful and amnesic of this experience until I met my mentor, Don Celso Rojas Palomino, Eight years later, during one of my, the, the first shamanic ceremony I ever participated in. And I'll get to that in a bit, which is important for this story. So I'm there, 10 years old, on the other side, receiving this information about my life. The marriages I'd have, children, uh, education I'd have, my parents' divorce, et cetera, et cetera detailed information about my future and then all of a sudden it's communicated to me it's not your time to go you need to be healed and at that moment the being on my left just arched itself over to me and placed its luminous scintillating light lips over my torso right in the center of my heart and began this suction this, this ex classic shamanic extraction technique that some of you may be familiar with it felt like it was an eternal inhaling of my condition extracting my condition and then it lifted itself up like a willow tree of light and released it into this spiral of light that just vaporized into infinity. I was instructed to close my eyes, go within, and I passed out. I woke up the next day totally free of any asthmatic condition. My, it was predicted by the doctors of the time that I may die from the asthma, that I would be never be able to live at the sea level because of how severe it was. That came together with ulticaria, with severe allergies and hives and everything that I used to get full of. So there was an immune, I was compromised, my immune system was highly compromised. Now, Miro, Miro, yes. Time check, four minutes left. Thank you. So uh, as a result of that, I couldn't remember. We went back, I started my schooling, everything was good. I was clear of asthma. Fast forward to 18 years old, my first encounter with my mentor, Don Celso Rojas Palomino, the shamanic elder famed around the world. I have my first shamanic experience with him. Out of the middle of his altar ground, these three same beings of light emerge. And he looks at me, this is a, in the pitch dark, he looks over to me and he nudges me with his elbow. He says, do you remember them? So just put yourself in that situation. And I remembered everything at that moment. It just flooded my consciousness. So here's somebody that I had just met 
that in the middle of this very exotic shamanic ceremony invokes the presence of these three beings that had cured me of my asthma at age 10 that made themselves present and he was seeing them also. That turned my life upside down. And that was the motivating factor of why I went to Duke University, to Mitchell, and, and then to an Organization of American States Fellowship at Emory University and became involved in near-death research. Thank you.